straight black hair. Look, she's cute. You know, I could talk to her. Well, I went in to have my head combed by Deb, which I'd done many times. This vis visit occasioned the greatest sorrow to me that ever I knew in this world, or at this point, my marriage turned on emergency headlights. Our hot car accelerated down the hill, no brakes because. While Deb Willett was combing my head, my wife comes up suddenly and did find me embracing the girl. My hand subsucotus, my mane in her cunning. And in comes my wife. She sees it. She's struck mute. She's frozen. I, I mean, not like, you know, when you pick up a few things at the grocery store or like pedal your bike. No. Froze. Totally paralyzed. Then her voice finally comes to her and it grew quite strange and out of order. Okay, so that night in bed, I'm very tentative. And my wife says, very little also. Neither, look, we, 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 we couldn't sleep all night. And then at about two in the morning, she starts raging. She goes on and on. At last, it appeared plainly what her trouble was, what she saw. But I'm full of anxiety because I don't know how much she saw. You know, my mind is in this rapid interplay between impression and fact. You know, but after her much crying and repro <laughs> reproaching me for philandering, I did thus promise my love to her and forswear any hurt that I did to her until at last she seemed to be at ease again. So toward morning, very little sleep. Okay, so the 26th, rose and up, but my mind is mightily troubled for the girly Deb, who I fear I have undone by this, my wife. He's telling me she will turn Deb out of doors. And then at dinner, silence between my wife and me. I know, I mean, their friendship is over. So all evening, I'm busy. My wife is full of trouble in her looks and so anon to bed. So about midnight, she wakes me and falls foul of me again. But I notice her rhetorical style is radically changing. Her language is blunt and sharp and now She's reaffirming that she saw me hug and kiss the girl. The latter, I denied I, the hugs I confessed. <laughs> but not more. Listen, I don't know what she actually saw. So I'm owning up to some indiscretions. But at the same time, I am emphasizing that there was really no harm in it. You know, I'm coming up with this strategy on the fly, right? She at last was quiet and so to sleep, and I am hoping that things blow over. 27, what then happened was this. In the morning, when I'm up, my mind hurt. I tr was troubled for the poor girly, but I couldn't figure out how to get an opportunity to speak with her, which I needed to do. And so my wife, toward bedtime, started to rant at me, threaten me. So I pour two glasses of Chardonnay for us, and I gesture to the couch, and I gently led her to sit, and I lit a candle, and I put on some quiet piano music, and I tucked a small blanket around her feet, and then I mightily made it my business to appease her all I could possibly, and by good words and fair promises, I did make her peaceful. She stared at the edge of the rug for a while. And then we went to our bed. I sense that there are deer in the wood, but woods, but they're so they're so quiet, it's not fair. October 28, 1668. Next day, we rose with perfect good peace. Inside I am freaking about the girly, who I have no mind to part with. Look, I write her name on rock bathroom walls and truck stops. I learn sad country songs and I sing them in empty dive bars. I try to catch her eye without my wife seeing. And if I can right away, I need to pass a note to her to tell her what I haven't confessed to, you know, the main of the cunning issue. She 
should never breathe a word about that. So this morning, I play a note as she passes me in the hallway. Later, she points one back at me, and, my, and I am in agony. My desire is legible. Its edges clearly rendered. 29th, 30th. I am not a certified forklift driver, and I am driving this one without a license on a rocky piece of earth. 31st. I vowed to Mark to buy my wife a petticoat and some rich lace. Third, up, and I go downtown to the office. At noon, to dinner, and I'm home. I spy my wife eyeing my eyes, looking into Deb's eyes, which I could not do. Her charm, it's like an icicle in the brightest sun. An icicle in a state of sparkle and melt. And then, I see the poor girly drop a tear. She is indeed my sacrifice for Deb. So that night, my wife tells me of her desire of firing death. It must be. So therefore, though it cannot but grieve me, I must bring my mind to tolerate her leaving. Truth is, though it hurts, I think it would be better. I mean, she should be gone for both my wife's peace and mine. And some reasons of finance as well. It would be best for me to let her go. Listen. You know, I think it would be good if when you get married, you make an agreement with your partner that you have to get remarried every seven years. So you can always be in like an active relationship to your choice. Although the no escape clause has a certain comfort. Fourth, this is actually the day's writing of the fifth, though it stands under the sixth. My mood is so troubled, so cluttered. It's no, no wonder that I fall into these mistakes in my journey. Seven. I want to say there are wild animals in the city, and we can use spikes, nets, traps, poison, but let's concede. They will inevitably nest under our roof. Eight. Lord's Day. Up. And at my chamber all morning, the girlie's still with us. I see her cowering in my back kitchen, her dark print dress blending into the wallpaper, her back rounded, her head bowed and turned away. This pains me. I love the girlie. No matter how much muscle I put into it, I cannot undream, unwant, unlove. November 9th. There are protocols regulations for missing documents, long lost orphans, stolen property, but there are no boots for this kind of downpour. So the day up and I again in despair, I fling another note to Deb. And in the note, I advise her that I continue, will continue to deny that ever I kissed her. And now I'm thinking, you know, maybe the main and the Coney thing I'm rethinking the evidence. Maybe it never happened. You know, it's kind of like a racing in my mind. I'm generally uncertain about everything at this moment. And by the way, as I'm thinking this, I know it sounds contradictory. I am simultaneously asking for God's pardoning me this act, if, if it did happen, which I'm not completely sure it did. November 10th. Tomorrow, I shall buy my wife the most fine cloth and let her wear black patches if she desires, which are much in fashion. Eleven. Now, first thing in the morning, my wife tells me about all the men that she herself refused out of faithfulness to me, where several she found very hot, <laughs> which I did acknowledge and wept, and at last were pretty good friends. So, to bed. But after a half an hour's sleep, she wakes me, frantic, a lurching clown in a red wig. She is in attack mode. There are no boots for this kind of downpour. It is quite a scene. I mean, I'm in tears myself. She's mad with raving, though I wasn't totally buying the raving. Twelve. 
Who do I think I am? I can't have her. Thirteen. So, first thing this morning, we called Deb Miller to my chamber, and there did, with tears in my eyes, discharge her. But as I'm doing the bidding of my wife, something shifts in me. Something that hits me as possible, if not probable. Deb is a cunning girlie, if not a swat. This misery is not my fault. I have been put under her spell. She's a witch. I have been seduced by her dark powers that I cannot understand. They exist in some other realm of reason. Were you ever both fighting and loving an idea simultaneously? Because this is how I felt. As I fired the girly for Jesus. So that evening, I hear my wife, Deb, say that the girly has found employment and she will be gone tomorrow morning. Good news, that's good news. But part of me is stunned. The truth is that I have a good mind to have the maidenhead of this girl. But she'll be gone, and I know not whither. Fifteen. Were you ever a bird flying into a glass window? This morning I have a mighty urge to encounter, animate, and engage with the girlie. So, I'm wrapping up 40 sous in paper to give her as a farewell gift, but I hear my wife already going down to the kitchen. And she comes back up. She says, Deb is in the kitchen, therefore I cannot go in the kitchen. And then out of nowhere, my wife casts a mean eye upon me. She calls me a dog and a rogue with a rotten heart. I wish it was rotten at this point so I could be less emotional. Of course, I bore her reproaches in a vast silence. And in this silence, we both hear the coach leaving outside the window. I know Deb Willett is gone. All is quiet. I'm to the office. My heart is sad, but I decide then and there I shall forever be a slave to my wife. She deserves it. <clears throat> Later, in bed with more pleasure that night with my wife than I think in all the times of our marriage before, I realize now I want ultimately to roost in a warmer, more stable environment. 17. The Lord's Day. So, to the office to write down all this in my journal. For six or seven days, my mind, having been so obstructed and shadowy, is never get the time nor the clarity to do it. But you can tell by the mistakes I've made in, in, in the journal these days. But concerning Deb, I must confess, I know now that I would be glad to find her, though I fear it would be my ruin. My mind is drawn to an aftermath which hasn't occurred yet, but must. 18. Early the next morning, I go to Whetstones Park, a place totally I'd never been to. And I understand from overhearing my wife that Deb is working there for a doctor. So I look around, I cruise the district, maybe I'm hoping to see her in a window or passing by a shop, and then home to my wife. I'm taking her temperature, she seems pretty calm, so I am at mighty ease in my mind about my wife, my, my hopes to find Deb without the knowledge of my wife. No equation has ever been so perfectly designed. A pristine triangle. 19th of November, 1668. Lay long in bed talking with my wife, she being unwilling to let me go out alone for fear of my going to death, which I do passionately deny. But God forgive me, as soon as I'm up, I'm, I'm out by coach directly to Somerset House to find out where the doctor's lodgings are. So I talked to some bike messenger, and he tells me that he'll inquire about this little gentlewoman where one Deb Willett, and I send him 
see how she's doing. At last. I see. The guy riding the back and my heart is pounding. He tells me. Ben says, I may see her. And he gives me her address. I completely lose control of the car. I am veering off the road. I am going to total it, which I don't care. I have code red. I know I must go to her this very night. And so by foot, it's by now it's dark. I go and my God, she comes to meet me. Her charm is like an icicle in the brightest sun, an icicle in a state of sparkle and melt. I don't want to say I wasn't thinking snow, but it is coming now. So, home. And there I told my wife, I'll bury her. She's distracted. She's hanging the new damask curtains that the upholsterer just delivered. I decide I'm going to buy her trim for her new body. But up to the office all morning, my heart is filled with joy to think what a safe condition all my matters now stand between my wife, my dad, and me. I am practically skipping home. I run upstairs to see the upholsterer. They're busy, you know, at work, hanging the gray silken floor-length drapes in my study, but I find my wife sitting sad in the dining room laughing with Pop. She looks in my eyes and she names me false and mean. I know, she knows that I was with Deb yesterday and my mind is racing. Was she following me? How does she know this? Nevertheless, I begin I'm denying it with all my heart. And then I experience this radical change in my mind in a desperate wish to forever discharge my heart of this wickedness. I did confess about yesterday's experience, which she doesn't accept. She says she wants 400 pounds from me, and then she'll walk away. But that's not good enough. She's going to make all the world know that I'm a liar and a rogue. But I'm not anticipating going public with her data is going to win her cohorts. Dad has to be fabricated and or discredited. Then I see it from a wide shot. I wonder if perhaps this entire episode binds us tighter in the bunting of our original promise. So at last I swore with my hand on the Bible never to see Deb as long as I live. She takes the, the hand on the Bible thing very seriously. She comes down on a dime, stops threatening me, and they are beyond my hopes. She looks at me and to Ben, and so je did hazer con elle to so to her consent. This is the worst injury I have ever sustained on the field. So what happens next? even surprises me in desperation and in earnestness. I fall on my knees in my chamber and begin to pray to God and ask for his help. I am a desperate beginner. I'm a mess on the floor and I am giving myself up. This day, the upholsterer has finished the hanging in my best chamber, but my heart sorrow is so great I can't enjoy how great my house is starting to look with the redo. 20 seconds. This morning, to Whitehall by water, my friend Howie is with me. He's supposed to go with me everywhere until my wife trusts me again. <laughs> I'm good with this, because I've resolved before God never to do her wrong again. But. When I come home, I find my wife on her bed in a horrible rage, a fresh hidden, pulling my hair. At last, it comes to this. If I will, she says, if I will write to Deb and call her a whore in my own hand and tell her I hate her. But then I see my friend Howie weeping upon me. So I did write the letter with the forward knowing Howie's going to wipe that heart out. So this letter pleased my wife. She gives it to Howie. It 
carried to the girly, you know, at the doctor's office. So when Howard left, I fell upon my knees in prayer, calling for the help of my God. And so I vowed to pray every night from now on, hoping this gives me some relief. 23rd, first thing in the morning, I meet Howie for coffee. He tells me that he crossed out the whole part in the letter. But he kept in the part that I never want to see her again and hate her. So it's done. 24th, Lord's Day. Today is the Lord's Day and my wife saying, goodness. Well, she spends the whole day making herself clean after four or five weeks in this continued jerk. I feel it, it would even be unfair for me to comment on this. But now, it is like ritual bath time. I'm cluttering around the house. I'm knocking off nails. I'm making little repairs to things I've neglected, misleads. And then to the office to get back to my journal. Some days I've been leaving it imperfect. And this matter is mighty grievous to me. For of late, I could not write well or, or at all. 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 3rd, lay long in bed with my life, with my wife, we're, 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 my business is going better than ever. You know, I think the prayer is helping. Folks, I'm going to be perfectly honest. If the mind is a butterfly, mine is resting lightly on the flower. 31st. Thus ended this month with very good content that hath been the most sad to my heart and the most expensive to my purse. Furnished my wife's closet. New coach and horses, finer than anything we've ever had. Really makes me look like a rich man. And so anon in the evening we went through the 